So, all right, well, I want to tell you guys a little bit about Dondo Moore, and that is my charity. We go um, three times a year, take groups there. Um, another photographer and I, Travis Googleman, started Dondo Moore a couple years ago. And uh, it's, it's been a really special journey being able to be a part of this. And it started because Travis went with another, uh, went to, to photograph for a group that does volunteer work there. And he went and photographed and he came back and flew in almost immediately, had to come to a convention to teach. And it happened to be a place where I was teaching and Travis and I had been friends for a while. And we met together with uh, about five or six of us and he told us all about what had happened on his trip and, and what all he had seen and just, you know, you guys have to come, you have to go back with me. And so we did, we went back pretty soon, um, right after, like the, the next month, we all packed it up and went. And while we were there, I mean, it, and it was just an amazing trip, but the more and more that Travis and I talked, the more we decided we, we really need to be here, we wanna be here and um, just be doing more. And we went back the next time together, took another group, and it has just kind of grown from there. But we go about every three to four months and work with the orphanages there. And I wanna share with you a video, and this is just a quick little video uh, Josh Peterson put together. He was one of the photographers, a friend of mine that came on one of the, the um, I think the trip previous to this last one. I just got back right before I came here. Um, so he was on the one before. So that's going to play here for you. So oh, that was a little video that Josh put together for us and really every single trip I've been there probably 10 times now and every trip means that much more and getting to involve other people and and you know obviously where my reach is is photographers so we take groups of photographers and not not to do workshops or to even photograph we all do photograph but we go to work with the children and to be with the children and Part of what I do in bringing groups is help the people that I bring to do fundraising in their own studios or in their own business. And when I say studios, I mean your photography business, even if you don't have a studio. Um, but one of the things that we do is we incorporate the Little Angels program that I've been doing for so long. And the first year Travis and I started our 501c3 in March, and we set a goal to raise $100,000 that first year and we had hit that goal by November 1st of that year. So we're, we're pretty proud of the efforts there. We've been able to do that again this year. This is our second full year. And, um, and really, you know, and it's, it's one of those things where we get there a lot of times and we're doing so much, but, you know, not making a dent. And there's times when you kind of, you know, you beat yourself up over that, like, what really can I do? Um, but Travis always tells us the story about the, the starfish or the sea fish on the, on the ocean. And um, a man was there and he was throwing them back in and tossing in one at a time and throwing that, them back in. And another man came walking down the beach and he said, what are you doing? There's so many of them, you know you can't make a difference. And the man stopped and he picked another one up and he threw it in 
And he said, I made a difference to that one. So, you know, so that's kind of our philosophy when we're there is, you know, if we can touch the life of one child and make a, one child's life different, um, it's, it's worth it. You know, we, we have to keep going. And it, we're not, you know, we, we're not just, just in Ecuador. We both do lots of work at home. We're both involved in a lot of charities at home. But Ecuador has just become kind of second home for both of us. We, you know, we love being there and love, love these kids. We go back to some of the same orphanages every time. One in particular that we just, we would take every one of those boys home if we could. And then we try to visit new ones as well. Um, in Quito alone, there's 75 orphanages. So it's just, you know, it's a, it's a poverty stricken area. However, everything's very expensive. It's very hard to understand the way the government runs in these kind of places. Um, because you, you know, we employ a couple of social workers and we employ a couple of English teachers and some different people that we pay their salary for the whole entire year. And their salary for a year is like $8,000. But you go to the grocery store to buy food and food is the same price it is here. So it's, it's a really, it's a hard thing to understand, you know, and, and these kids are amazing. The kids at this boys home that we've kind of adopted, um, we've done everything there from replace their sewer systems and build chicken coops so that they can have food and have, uh, you know, a, a way to learn a trade and to work, you know. Um, we're going to be planting gardens there when we go back in the spring. We built a whole second building uh, for this place. And, you know, we've just done all these things. And so we've really become a part of their lives and they look forward to us coming back every time. But we were there uh, one time. And now when we go, we take, we, we take at least enough rice. We usually take about 10 uh, thousand pounds of rice, I think is what it is, because we take thousand pound bags, hundred pound bags, sorry, <laughs> um, hundred pound bags, but you know, we bring truckloads of them in because we try to feed them at least rice until we get back the next time. And, um, but we, we were there at one point and we were, we had just gotten there and we were running around and playing with the kids and we noticed this truck coming in and some boys jumped in the back of it and they drove back out of the orphanage. And so we looked at Pablo, who, is the, who runs the orphanage, and we said, you know, where are the boys going? What's going on? And he said, do you want to see? And he said, come with me. So we got in a van with him, and we drove a couple miles down the road, and we got out. And already by the time we got there, we saw people running down a hill with bowls and spoons, mo mothers and children, lots of other children. And our boys were in this uh, schoolhouse and they were feeding rice to the community. And we got there and we said, Pablo, sometimes you don't have any food. How can you feed the community? <laughs> and he said, it is our responsibility to take care of people less fortunate than us, and we want to teach the boys this lesson. And they once a week go and feed the community and are teaching these boys to take care of people less fortunate than them, these kids who have no parents. A lot of them have ended up here because either they've been abandoned, they've been abused, they've been left in dumpsters and tied to trees. And I mean, the stories are just unbelievable. And yet they're being taught these wonderful things to be a part of their community, to serve their community. They're all taught um, in this one particular orphanage that we've come to love so much. I mean, they, they have, are learning to love the Lord. They, I mean, they're, I mean it's, a, it's a special place. So, <laughs> so I want to talk to you guys about charitable marketing events and how to turn this event system into something that you can do as a fundraiser. And this is where it all began for me. I started in 2001 working with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. And at the time, I really wanted to do something for a charity. And so I, I had just kind of made that decision. And you know, a lot of times we'll go and we'll listen to something and it's like, oh yeah, I got to do that. I got to do that. And then we go the next time, oh yeah, I better, I better do that. I, I need to get home and put this into place. Um, and then it takes that, you know, maybe third time or even fourth time before you finally go and get it done. And I know you all know this from even like watching Creative Live and whatever we've been to, you know, you gotta kinda hear it pounded in a couple times before you make that um, decision. So I had gone back to, had heard, it, heard a lecture, and I don't even know if it was a photography convention, but somewhere, Someone was talking about charity, and in my family, everybody's been healthy. You know, we, we haven't really had a reason to be tied to a charity. That's, that's been something we've been fortunate with. 
And so I had no idea who we were going to work with or what we were going to do, but I knew I needed to make a commitment to do that. And so I went back to the studio on a Monday morning and called everybody together and said, I want to commit, make a commitment to this that we are going to do, start fundraising for a charity. I don't know what charity, I don't know who, but this is just something that has been you know, pressed upon me that we need to be giving back. And so we all formulated some ideas and decided, you know, <laughs> threw some ideas around. And then it was about two days later when my office manager came in and she said, brought everybody together and she said, my niece was just diagnosed with leukemia and we've been given our charity. So we started working with the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society at that time called them, asked them to come in and sit down with us and really explain to us the child blood-related cancers. And, um, you know, so that we, you know, nobody could ever understand. But just so we could have, you know, an idea of what would be, we'd be working with and what we'd be asking people to fundraise for. And so when we did it, we decided, and as they came and talked to us, they actually presented me with the idea of, you know, well, we know this other chapter in another part of the country that does a calendar every year would you be willing to do a calendar? And I said, yeah, that'd be, you know, I would love that, that'd be awesome. And so, um, in my mind, the first thing that I was gonna do was just, I was gonna do session fees and donate them to a charity. So it was gonna be a $100 session fee, and it was all gonna go for fundraising. I was gonna make the money from the print sales. Well, once we started this, this calendar, <laughs> we decided that we were gonna do voting, um, and it was gonna be a dollar a vote, and all that was gonna be fundraising. So now we not only make the $100 from the session go to fundraising, it's the, you know, you, if, if I photograph your child and you want your child in the calendar, you're going to get all your friends to go and donate a dollar per vote to try to get to be in the calendar. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so it, that's how this whole thing started of doing these portrait events. This is going to look real familiar to you. This is the same exact pricing and packages that I started with when I started Real Kids. So um, same thing, four packages from 480 to 960. I've had the same pricing for many years on the, this event thing. And that's why when, we, when I took it to an actual product line in the studio, I knew that it would work. I'd been doing this for, for quite a while. Um, it is just, you know, it's the prints, it's the storyboards. Um, I, I am not going to be taking this to the framed portrait level. That's gonna be a completely separate thing. So we're going to keep this like it is. It's still basically the same prices, but I'm not going to meet with each one of these people. I photograph so many kids during these events that I'm not making the personal consultation calls. And that's OK. It doesn't, you know, we don't need to do that. Um, we do this in March is when we photograph all the sessions for Little Angels. And usually voting is the whole entire month of April or May this year because I ran behind on everything. Typically, we like to have our calendars printed before September 1st because that's when they can go on shelves. And if, you, if, you, if they're after September 1st, people don't want them anymore because they've already gotten their calendars out. They started selling them. So, um, so that's how that goes and kind of how this whole thing began. So it's one way that even without the voting, if you decide that you want to do fundraising for a charity, I did this for the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society for 10 years. Now I'm doing it for Don Moore. This was actually the first year Last year, I still wasn't ready to tell LLS that, you know, I, I thought, I'm going to finish out year number 10. I still want to be involved with them and do whatever I can for them, but I'm going to put the, my charity efforts where my heart is, and so that's what Dondo more, more. So now I've, I've helped other people do that as well. Um, that was a 2007 calendar, so that's, that's an old cover there mm -hmm. on the right, but um, with the voting, it's a dollar per vote, the top 12 the top one gets the cover, and then the next 12 get the 12 calendar pages. And then we have a notes page that we can put anywhere from one to as many as we want to on there. And I usually try to include quite a few if we have votes that were pretty close, you know, um, to getting up there. So we like to get as many people included as possible because that get, gets more calendars out. One of the other things that it's done is it's tied me into a lot of local businesses. And when we do the events, I don't do the events at my studio. I always want to tie in another business. And the reason is, is because I'm going to go where the people are. And the people are not in Winterset, Iowa. <laughs> and so I want to 
Um, I'll give you this kind of as a, a tip if you're going to do something like this, and this is a big tip. Um, when you're partnering with another business, look at your local publications and find out who is placing like full page ads in the newspaper, who is taking out ads on the local TV stations during the evening news, and those businesses are people that you want to be tied into. And that's because if I have, I'll do, go do an angel session at a bank or at a car dealership or at a jeweler. It doesn't matter. If there's somebody that is in the media and in the marketplace, then that's going to be my power going back to that media. So if I'm doing an event at a car dealership, they're, they're going to advertise for me as being part of, you know, um, Holmes Autos is giving back. You know, that's the way that they can promote that they're giving back, is that they're hosting the Little Angels event for the 2013 calendar. Um, so they can promote it that way. I also have the power then to go to the media and say, Lori Nordstrom Studio has partnered with Holmes Auto to present the 2013 Little Angels fundraising campaign. And with the power of Holmes Auto, who advertises and does full page ads, or they do, uh, you know, have media coverage on TV, they're not going to tell me no when I go to them with a press release or a news release. So, um, so that's going to give you a lot of power in the media, which is something that is only going to grow your business. And we talked a little bit about that Monday. Ernie asked about you know how I want to give back and I want to do this, but I've I've got to I've got to do business and make money. And absolutely, we have to be business people. We have to make money so that we can give money. And that's one really quick, great way that you can do it and you can partner up with another business, even if you don't have a studio, if you're on location, whatever your circumstances, and you can use the power of that other business as your marketing. So do you keep, <coughs> do you keep print sales and then you donate session fees? I donate the session fees and all the voting. Okay. Yep. And so, and even if you don't do a calendar, if you don't do a voting, if anybody is interested in doing fundraising for Don Amore, I'm so happy to help you get set up and do this. Um, we can also host your calendar voting on our website. So, um, so that's a way that we can help you with that as well. We <coughs> hosted Little Angels this year on, on the Don Amore website, and people just go there, and it's set up like a shopping cart where they can do one vote for $1, five votes for $5, 10 votes for $10, and we have it all the way up to $100. So, um, you know, so they go there, and it's, it's just a straight donation, and they know that. So it's a, it's a really, it's a powerful thing and people like getting involved in something that they feel is a charity. We have people come through that, you know, they'll get a, a, just a couple prints. And then we have people that go out every, all out every single year and get that top package. I have one area of people that I do an event with every year and almost every one of them gets that top package. So, you know, it's, it's all very, very variable when you're doing something like this. You'll have some people that'll just coming to have their kids photographed and doing the calendar, they just want their kids in that calendar. So they're not even buying prints for me. So it's kind of all over the place. But I knew the model of it was something that would work. And I told you guys the other day about how the progression went with doing the sales in person and then doing them online, which bombed, and then, you know, or t first trying to do them, bring them all back to the studio, which was workflow craziness, and then putting them all online, which bombed, and then I went back to immediate the sales following the session. And because that model was the one that worked, that's the one that I plugged into the Real Kids events. So this is where it all began. <laughs> all right, that's where that video was gonna go, but that we already did it. Um, so now you guys, uh, do you have any questions about doing it for a charity before we move on? Everybody good? I think we're good. We got we're half good. an hour left. All right, half an hour. Let's do this. Um, and if anybody <coughs> wants any information, we do go to Ecuador three, four times a year. So email me, send me a message on the Dondo Moore site, and we'll get you plugged in. If, if anybody's interested in coming, I'll get, get you that information. It's a great trip. All right, so who is up for some goal setting? <laughs> Yay. All right, setting goals, I, you know, it's all, it is all about challenging yourself and really pushing things to the next level. You know, right now there's a lot out about, you know, dream boards and, you know, the secret and all, all these other things. And, you know, all of that is great, but you got to do the work to make something happen. We can't just sit and wish and dream and believe. 
Um, you got to have those things too, but you got to take the steps to make it happen. And writing things down is key. That's you know key number one, making that list of goals. And this is kind of the list of, of goals that I go through when I'm writing out my goals. And at the first of the year is always a great time because that's kind of when we feel like we've got a clean slate. And that time is coming up. So, you know, take some time in December, 1st of January, where you can just take a couple days for yourself and just do some writing and, and think about really what you want for the next, for this coming year. Um, faith, family, fellowship, friendship, fun, freedom, fulfillment, and financial. And, you know, all those things are important to all of us for different reasons. They're all going to mean something different to each one of us. And um, financial is there at the end, not because it's the least important, but because it takes the longest. It really does to sit down and really think about what your financial goals are for the next one year, the next three years, the next five years, and what that's going to look like. But take some time to really sit and figure all those things out. Be specific with your goals. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these things because I want to get through this, but <coughs> it's, the more specific that you can be, the better it's going to be for your end result. Make a plan. That means put action steps in place. So if I know, you know that I, I want to have this happen, what are the steps that it's going to take to, to get there? Make a plan for that. Track those results and reward yourself. You always want to look for something that you can say, okay, when I hit this goal at this step, you know, not this one out here, but this, you know, when I hit step three, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reward myself with X and write it down and set that goal for yourself as well. Be accountable to someone. Telling somebody else what your goals is <coughs> gets you that much closer to making them happen. Read daily. Huge part of personal growth and development. Read Write anything. it all down. What was that? Read anything. <laughs> sure. Read anything. <laughs> I mean, you know, anything that's going to get you closer to that goal. Any one of those goals. This is a statistic from the American Society for Training and Development, and they found that when you consciously decide to act on a, an idea, you're going to be 25%, there's going to be a 25% chance that you're going to hit that goal, that you're going to make it happen, just by deciding. If you set a time frame and give yourself a, a deadline, you're at 40% likelihood to make that happen. If you put a plan in place, put those action steps in place, you go to 50%. If you commit it to someone else, it takes you to 65% likelihood that you're going to make it happen. And if you make an appointment with that person that you've committed to and say, hold me accountable, we're going to talk again on this date, and I want you to make sure that I'm on track, that I'm staying on schedule, you take your chances of achieving that goal to 95%. And I think that is huge. I mean, that is such a powerful thing to really stop and think about. Even, you know, I mean, why? Why do you think that is? Anybody want to guess? Because you're saying, <clears throat> well, for me, I look at that and go, okay, I'm writing. I have, um, you know, the uh, acting on an idea, time frame, develop a plan, commit to s committing to someone. Um, and I don't think it can be probably anyone. It probably has to be somebody that you that you trust, and probably who's someone, maybe somebody who loves you, and somebody who's close to you. So, <coughs> you know, I just think when you're when you're <coughs> when you're being held accountable. <coughs> Um, to hitting a goal, I just think there's there's more pressure, you know, there's more pressure to do it. And um, you don't and for me personally, someone. I'm not the type that's going to sit back and just go. I mean, I'm gonna. I like winning, and so <laughs> I'm gonna go after winning. It. Maybe a little bit more aggressive than if it was, you know, rela oh, in a relaxed kind of situation. So. Yep. Well, we all. I mean, we have heard from the internet. I've heard from all of you. I know for myself. You know, we're, we will let ourselves down. You know, a lot of times we don't feel good enough to really, you know, to get ourselves to that place. And, you know, Jana said earlier, it's that truth that really hurts. You know, it's, it's hard to, to, I mean, do I even deserve to reach that goal? You know, I mean, sometimes that's even there. But once I've committed it to somebody else and I've asked them to hold me accountable, I don't want to let that person down. We're willing to let ourselves down but not this person that I just committed to. And so that's the power of that. And, you know, really think that through. And once you get your goals written down, you know, read them to somebody. 
Uh, make, make yourself accountable to someone. I think that's, I mean, that, that is just so powerful that you're looking at that number. There was a study that was done, and we know that now. And I'm going to tell you, if you write down a goal, talk to somebody about it, and ask them to hold you accountable, you're almost guaranteed to make it happen. So tell me if you want before you leave. <laughs> we, we have already all, like we the other day, <laughs> we made you know this pact with each other. We are so you have changed our lives. We are so grateful to <coughs> you, Lori, and to Creative Live because you've been so inspired and you've made us believe that we can do it. And we are all going to be in, reporting to you and saying, "Look at what we did." Awesome. We're thrilled. <laughs> She's got Thank dollar you. signs on her iPad. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, funny. Thank you. All right, that's awesome. Um, this is a quote from Timothy Ferris, who was just here. Mm -hmm. um, but I love this. Tim said, someday is a disease that will take, you, take your dreams to the grave with you. I mean, that is powerful, um, you know, powerful statement that when we keep saying, well, someday I'll get that done. Someday I'll get to that. Someday I'm going to make more money. Someday I'll be able to raise my prices. Someday I'm going to feel like I'm worth it. You know, that's a disease. That's going to take that dream to the grave with you. Someday is never going to happen when that's your, you know, your lack of goal. Not your goal, but your lack of it. All right, some things to do for fun before we get into the business plan for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, I always like to just throw out just little personal assignments. And part of that is because I am so streamlined, so niched, and so stylized in my or unstylized maybe, um, simple in my, in my photography that, you know, I've got to do things to kind of stretch here and there. And that little video that you saw of Lucy, you know, I don't mind doing those things even for clients every once in a while if it's going to get me to jump out of my box here and there. Um, this was a project that I'd been wanting to do for a long time, and it was photographing a baby every single month of his first year and did that um, a while back, and now this is a product line in our studio. So they can choose to purchase the, in the, the first year collection by the month, and we do it, their album's included, they have to purchase that kind of to do it, and then um, we photograph them, and then they, they get a giant canvas at the end of that, and it's a 40-inch um, canvas. So, and I have this hanging in my studio above a couch, and it's, everybody stops and talks about it. But it was, you know, it started with that personal thing that I just wanted to do as an assignment for myself and, and make that happen. And I love it. It's the evolution of man. <laughs> Everybody <laughs> always says that. Without the monkey. Yeah. Um, but I love it. Love it, love it. So lots of different things that you can just do for fun. And that's in your workbook too, you guys. So we won't stay there. Um, all right. So getting into the business plan. And hopefully everybody's downloaded this by now. But, um, and so I'm not going to go through every single thing particularly, but I just want to flip through a little bit and then of course you can go through this yourself. And I just want to say one more time where people can download this is okay, on great. Photo Talk Forum. Yes, it's on the Photo Talk Forum blog, so it's phototalkforum.com slash blog. And then over there on the right you're going to see the, the download for the business plan as well as a download for an educational resource guide. And both of those have, the, you know, the business plan and the other one has just tons of info in it. Great and stuff. And they are free. Free, free, free. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> free for everyone. Free 93. Um, all right, so business plan, step one, is going back through, excuse me, those goals and aspirations that we just talked about. So really thinking about what your goals are for, uh, for right now, for next year, for three years, and for five years, and to be thinking about those things. And... I, and I did, you know, tell you the story the other day about dreaming, and it's great to dream, but think about your goals as really concrete things that you can take action steps to get to. You know, don't set yourself up for failure. Yes, you want to reach, and you want to grow, and you want to um, get things done, but decide, you know, I want to do X amount of sessions this year. I want my sessions to average this much this year. Um, I want to do, you know, I want to do five portrait events in the next six months. You know, whatever those goals are, I want to make a list of 10 people that I can contact, find out if they want to be a host mom. And someone was asking earlier about, you know, I feel, I feel bad asking, I would feel bad asking my friends who've been, I've been photographing and to then go ask their friends to come and spend all this money. 
Well, maybe one of your friends needs to just be someone you practice on. Tell that person what your goals are and then sit down with her and say, you know, I'm gonna, I wanna practice with you. I don't, I'm not expecting you to do this, but let me practice with you and see how this feels and how this sounds. So, you know, that's a way that that friend can help you instead of asking her to do that. And then maybe that first person is that person that you saw at the gym or, you know, that you see every Sunday at church and you think, man, is she well put together. Everybody loves her, everybody wants to talk to her. Um, you know, the gym, the, the yoga studio, wherever, you know, you, you, we all know somebody that fits the, the type, the target client. Um, let's see. There's little all through this. There's action steps. There's things to take it a step further, things that you can do. So step two in your business plan is to describe your business in detail. And you want to describe everything about your business. And if you don't have the business that you want right now, describe the business that you're going to be creating. That's what a business plan is all about. The business plan started to go to a bank to get money. That's where the business plan originated. So think about it in that way. If I were to be creating the business that I want to create as if I was going to get a loan to start a new business, what would that look like? And start and describe that. Your target client, we've got to describe, which we did together. Describe <laughs> your target market. Um, describe your market area. Your mini mission statement. Uh, my mini mission statement, and when I was taught and went through this, we were taught that we need to write our mission statement in, in eight words or less. And so mine became making memories through images and experience. So it's not just the image, but it's, it's the experience itself. It's as we're photographing, what we're communicating to the client, what we're, you know, how we're describing the product, what I'm creating in the home, you know, the speech I gave earlier <laughs> about really, you know, those memories and what we are doing, the, the, the images that we're capturing, the memories that we're capturing. It's not just the memories, it's the experience that's happening as we're creating those, those images. So, um, so that's my mini mission statement. You know, what's yours? Um, we also, we did this last one, you know, describe the industry and how you will take advantage of the growth, the changes, et cetera. You know, we have to evolve and change. There was a day when I said, I will never sell a digital file. Never say never. <laughs> you know, we've got to grow and adapt with times. Destri describe your strengths. That's another thing that we did together. Why will you succeed? That's a big question to ask yourself. Why will you succeed? And you know, I propose the question to you, why should someone choose your business over the other 50 photographers down the street? You know, so this is another question. Why will you succeed? You should be able to describe that. Describe your backgrounds, experience, skills, and strengths. Um, you know, Janice, You've worked with kids, you were a youth leader. Write those things down. You know, those should be things that you're really proud of and things that you should be able to um, describe to people. Miley, you were a nurse in training, you know. You should, you should be able to use those things and those skills um, working with, the, with kids that you're working with. Um, and this goes on to talk about your legal form of ownership. And I know some of you are just in that process of trying to figure out which way to go. Um, it's great to talk to an accountant about that. And, you know, don't be afraid if you're not making much money yet to, to sit down and talk to an accountant and say, where should I be to start heading in this direction? I've started a business plan. This is where I want to be in a year. I want to be set up appropriately. And then get set up that way. Describe your products. This is a place to really get into your product lines and really dive deep into really what you want to offer. And we all, all have different things. Obviously, for me, I'm into the wild survey frames. And because I'm excited about it, I can get my clients excited about it. It might not be your thing. What is your thing? Really describe each one of those, those product lines. What will be your competitive advantages? That's your only. What's your, the, the reason that you, uh, you're zagging instead of zigging? <laughs> what are the disadvantages? And this is not a place for you to sit in you know, oh, poor me, <laughs> making those excuses, but really think about the things that, um, that are the disadvantages so that you can think about how you can turn those around. So instead of saying, you know, well, I don't have a studio space, you know, if that's one of your disadvantages, think about the value that you have not having a studio space that you can learn to communicate those things to your client. 
what product lines we'd be growing, changing, changing adding, uh, what's the pricing structure of each, of each of your products, and hopefully everybody has a little bit better handle on pricing structure. Um, we went through each one of those things, but here describe whether packaging makes sense to you, whether build a collection makes sense to you, a la carte makes sense to you. What, what's the best way for you to communicate your products to your clients? Describe your services and how you're unique. Again, I'm all on location, so I'm gonna describe that I'm unique because I'm coming right into my client's home. I'm helping them with personal clothing suggestions, with personal prop selections. I'm helping them with uh, the, their image placement and presentation. You know, all those things can be listed as a service in ways that if I can write those things down, I can then learn to communicate them to the client and when they should be communicated. Got gotcha, you, Amanda. <laughs> um, who is your target client expanded? So we're gonna, we're gonna talk more here about their characteristics, their buying habits, their geographic location. You know, dive deep into this. We t I talked to you guys about my experience with the dentist office with Jackson. You know, if you've got some place where you continue to go back to again and again, really think about why and write those things down and how you can put those into your own business and um, incorporate those with your clients. That's more about your target client. Research your market. There's some a couple links there that you can go to to just get statistics on your on your area. And it really is, it, this says, it's very surprising to look up this information. You'll find out all kinds of things. There's all kinds of things about the demographics, about the income level, about average house costs. You know, there's everything you can imagine. Um, the, you can find it all online now. So really research your area. And you, you might be like me, where you're in an area where, mm -hmm, not my target client. So I gotta figure out where my target client is. And my target client is 45 minutes away. That's okay, that's where I'm gonna market, that's where I'm gonna spend the time that I need networking, it's all gonna be right there. But you know, we gotta look those things up a lot of times instead of saying, nobody in Winterset, Iowa will pay $150 for an eight by 10. They're just not gonna do it. So I can sit there and whine about it, <laughs> or I can figure out where I can go to find those people. <clears throat> Let's see. Step five, identify your competitors. This is not a call to action to go sit and blog stock and <laughs> Facebook stock and crab about the photographer <clears throat> who's got the crappy work and <laughs> is getting 500 Facebook likes. You know, this, that's not what this is. That's, this is to look at what's going on and how you can be different, how you can be unique <clears throat> and attract those people to you. What are the advantages for using your studio over another studio? How does your product and service compare with your competitors? And I have always used the word competitor very loosely. To me, if somebody is, starts copying what I'm doing, I gotta figure out something else. And that's okay, that's a way for me to keep doing the next thing. Uh, right now, I think there's a few people around me who are a little bit afraid of me <laughs> for some reason. But it wasn't always that way in the beginning. I have literally walked into like a women's trade show where they have products and services for women. And I was helping a friend of mine set up a booth and was just about to leave. And a friend of mine, someone who had been to one of my workshops in my studio, walked around the corner, saw me, stood in the middle of the aisle and was completely freaked out. Turned white, I thought she was gonna throw up. <laughs> and you know, and I, I said hi to her, I was like, what's going on, are you okay? And she said, well, you're here, you're gonna see it, you might as well come over here. Walked around the next aisle over, she had a booth at this women's event. Her whole entire booth, the banners around her booth, was she had photographed one of my albums and reproduced it in banners around her booth. So not just ripping off images off a website like you see happening today, but literally in my studio, photographing product and claiming it as her own. And, you know, and, and that's not an isolated incident. <laughs> so These things have happened to me over and over over the years. Um, there was one similar thing that happened in the industry to me very early on. It was after one of my very first workshops. And I called someone um, in the industry and said, and was bitching about it. I mean, I was like, this happened. I can't believe this person did that. And she, ah. and he said, you just started speaking, didn't you? I said, yeah. He said, get used to it or get off the platform. Mm -hmm. And that was a huge, huge, 
You know, I mean, and I, I did have to make a decision at that time. Am I going to say, you know what, it is going to happen. If I'm here sharing it with you, it's yours, you know. Um, and that just, that, you know, I had to accept at that moment, that is my, that's my movement, you know. If once it, once it gets out there and gets copied, I'm ready for the next thing. And so it's, that was a great lesson to me in the beginning. And I'm not expecting, you know, that literally to happen to you. But, you know, but take those things as your, your momentum. Keep it moving forward. When somebody um, copies you or does something, do something else. It's time for the next best thing. All right. <clears throat> Economics, this is just going through your demographics of your area. Um, all these things, startup costs, marketing costs, and you know, this is a great exercise for you to go through when you're really ready to step it up and take it to the next level. It is like you're starting over, you're starting a new business, you're starting a new business model. So you know, go through all these things where you're looking at your marketing costs and, and budgeting. Um, typical startup marketing costs in a studio are gonna be five to eight percent. And so, um, even up to 10%. So, especially if you're brand new. So, you can consider that if you're gonna, um, for example, if you're gonna project that you're gonna make $1,000 on event, then you can spend up to $100 in marketing because you know that you've got that 10% budget there. If you're an existing studio, it's more like three to 5%. So, it goes down a lot further once you're, once you're rolling and in business. But it's good to look at all those those uh, different numbers as you're planning. Describe your products from your customer's point of view. Uh, great concept, and that's, you know, that's been a big issue this weekend because we've had a lot of people that have said, my clients don't want a frame, or what if they, what if they have their own frames? You know, really think about it from the other person's perspective. And if you can put yourself in, in the other person's shoes, be the consumer instead of the seller, you know, it, it takes, it's, it's a different mindset. And maybe you even want to ask a couple of your favorite clients. You know, you guys, take home your cute wild survey frame and just ask people, what do you think about this? Is this something that you would like to display in your home? What would you think about something like this larger on your walls? Take your catalogs. Um, you know, you guys out there on the internet, same thing. You know, get a catalog from a frame company, wild survey or otherwise, you know, maybe a traditional frame company, and just offer the <coughs> service. It doesn't mean that you have to do packages like me where everybody is getting it, but if you don't offer it, you'll never know. So think about it from the customer's point of view. Customer service, what are the things that you can do? Give them that star experience. What's something that you can do over and above? What are your guarantees? Write down your policies and procedures. And again, I don't like those words. <laughs> I don't have a lot of policies and procedures. Another thing that I haven't even mentioned, but when you do have quote unquote policies and procedures in your, in your business, don't ever just give them to your client to read and expect that to be the end of the day. Always communicate with them verbally anything that you want them to know. So if you, if you wanna have stuff that they can go to and click on on your website to get more information or send them to, great. If you wanna give them something printed, that's great. But make sure first to always ver verbally communicate it. All right, so um, this is defining your niche, and, and I really like this exercise, and read through this, because this is gonna give you some good ideas, and I'll give you just one. Um, but it's defining your uniqueness and how you're different, and then learning to verbalize and communicate that. So for example, number one, if you're a home studio and you love photographing children, then learn to put in your language. I specialize in portraits of kids being kids in an environment that makes them feel comfortable and carefree. So it's just, you know, it's learning to say very positively what you like to do. Um, looking, at, looking at all those, those positives of every situation, home studios, <coughs> tons of value, bringing in people, making them feel comfortable, making them feel at home, having stuff ready for kids, on location, we talked about that value, huge value there. So don't ever, you know, kick yourself around for <laughs> not having a studio. All right. Step 10 is your marketing strategy. <clears throat> strategy. So you're gonna look at how your clients are gonna find you. If it's referrals, then think about what your re referral campaign is gonna look like. Don't just expect referrals, be proactive about it. Part of your marketing might be actually calling people. We talked about cold calling the other day. 
Um, it might be uh, partnering with another business and hopefully everybody's gone through that who my target client is and when we do that we've got those those partners to partner up with when we know where they're spending time and spending money so write those things down how will you advertise advertise is kind of a dead word these days but you might want to think about that as if there's anybody that you want to partner with um, one of the places I advertise I, I do they actually give me the advertising but it's a local radio station that I work with and um, it's a it's a Christian radio station, a worship station, and I give them different uh, photography packages to put in the packages that they're giving away. And so what happens is, is, for instance, on Mother's Day, they'll have people that'll write in and what mother should win, you know, and they'll, people will write their essays on why their mom should win this package. And the package might include a weekend away at a bed and breakfast, a dinner at this place, a night at the movies or the theater, and a portrait from Lori Norsom Studio. So they do this, but every time this is, you know, promoted all through the, the contest, they're saying my name, saying their name, saying their name. So a lot of times that's when it's, you know, people have to have a third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh impression of you before they finally will pull the trigger. And so a lot of times that's just that additional impression where they say, I've heard that name before, you know, or they'll meet me and they'll say, where have I heard your name? And then as we get to talking, we figure out that's where it was. So, you know, think those things through and who you might partner up with that way. Um, and there's that statistic, uh, new businesses should plan on spending 6 to 10% on marketing, businesses over three years, 4 to 7%. So that was a little different than the numbers that I just said, but pretty close. Um, <laughs> your studio image, that is, <coughs> your studio image is going to carry into every part of your business. It's going to carry into how you answer the phone, it's going to carry into how you communicate with clients, all your printed pieces, your website, your blog, your newsletter, all of it. And I know when I started, I always thought your image was how you dressed or how your studio looked, you know, that was to me what your image was. But your image is everything about your business. So think that through, not just, you know, this is talking about logo and branding and, and that of course, it needs to tie into your personality. And if you can, if you're working with a designer on your logo, or you're thinking about creating a logo. I, I like to tell photographers to not do that <laughs> themselves. Um, most of us are not graphic designers. <coughs> As photographers, we all think we are. But um, you know, when you're working with a designer, a good graphic designer is gonna ask you about your personality. She's gonna ask you about your signature color. She's gonna you know, talk some of those things through with you. And I'm, I'm not saying she, meaning that a boy can't be a graphic designer. But, uh, <laughs> but, you know, a good graphic designer is going to talk those things through. <coughs> <coughs> All right, special events. Okay, and I think we're almost to the end of this. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> this is planning out special events that you might host, and you can even start planning out your uh, portrait events. So. Anything that's different from what you do on a normal day-to-day -day basis, that's going to be those special events. Um, that also gives some tips about raising prices, so um, read through that little part. Setting a marketing budget, it's going back through all the things that you just did. This also has a little freebie from Sarah Petty's promotional planning webinar, um, so you can click on that and listen to that. I, I really haven't heard a better promotional planning webinar than this one. She actually goes through every step of the process, helping you plan out a marketing plan, how to budget for it, how to market it, um, and how to get all of that on the paper. And then step 13 is going to be your pricing. Hopefully, we've given you enough ideas of that <laughs> over the last couple days. Um, and just, you know, just some good little tips there. Step 14, how are you going to handle your sales? Hopefully, everybody is convinced that you need to do your sales in person. And hopefully everybody out there is convinced that they need to do their sales in person, if nothing else. And again, you know, going back to think about what those, that one thing is that you could do tomorrow to make a difference in your business. Doing in-person sales, key, key, key. Um, what are some other ones? We named like three or four that you can do tomorrow. Packages. Think, don't put pricing online. <laughs> don't put pricing online. Add a bonus schedule. You can you know, raise those averages right away, tomorrow, just by doing that. Um, 
but in-person sales is huge. All right, and then we're going to look at sales projections, um, step 15, uh, and that is the end. So this, we're, we've, got, we've gotten to the end of this, and obviously I, I can't go into everything in detail, but this is very detailed for you. So if you'll take the time to sit and do this, or at least put time on your calendar to sit and do it, um, yeah, <laughs> maybe over a couple of days, there's a lot to read and go through here. You guys that have forum memberships, there's a whole forum thread of people <coughs> talking about, this is all there, but people talking about putting their business plan together and really defining some of these steps. So it's kind of nice to, and I've defined some steps there, so it's kind of nice to just see what other people would put um, in some of those places. So dig into that and, and look at that. So. All right. Lori, that well, was a quick, quick down and dirty <laughs> run through, but. <laughs> well, thank you so much for providing that template for everybody on your Photo Talk Forum blog. I do have, I know it's four o'clock, but I do have one final question for you. Yes. <laughs> because I'm still in awe of the fact that you started a business by yourself when you were 18. <laughs> and there's a lot of fear in doing that. And so I'm wondering now, after all of your experience, if you were to be talking to yourself, the 18 year old Lori, <laughs> and she was like, I don't know if I want to do this. What would you say? What would you say? What are your final words there? Well, that was a whole world ago. So I'm not going to talk to 18 year old Lori, okay. but I will, <laughs> will talk to the rest of you who, and I, I know there's a lot of fear and, um, you know, with photographers in general, it's, we don't think of ourselves as business people, even though that's exactly what we're doing. The minute we take a dollar from somebody, even if we're not making any money, the minute we take a dollar from someone, we've put ourselves into the position of this is my business. And, you know, and it is a very scary thing when you stop and think about it. And I saw some of your faces when you started seeing in black and white, okay, I need to charge that much or I'm not going to be profitable. I mean, it, it's scary. And so, you know, I think the biggest part is to really start believing in the power of, of photography, the power of what we do and really what we have to give to people. And, you know, and, and I've said it a million times, but take yourself out of the equation. And it's so, so hard because we're so personally tied to our product and what we do. But if you can take you out of the equation and really put that other person first, um, you know, when you're, when you're doing a sale, you're not a salesperson when you have the other person's best interest um, first and foremost before anything that has to do with you. So really think about the gift that it is, the power that we have as photographers to really celebrate life and celebrate love and celebrate relationships um, between people and learn to communicate those things that you're seeing in people and just by adding that bit of value to someone's day, you know, letting a mom see how special her, her husband is as a dad, letting a dad see how wonderful his wife is and how, what, you know, acknowledge the work that she took to get everybody together and everybody looking so cute. And then dad steps back and says, yeah, I mean, I really didn't realize how much work that was and I really didn't help much, you know. Um, but just communicating those things to people and bringing them together and helping them appreciate each other. And um, <clears throat> I'll tell one more little story if I can. <clears throat> Excuse me. I uh, had someone that worked for me at one time who three beautiful daughters and uh, I photographed the girls every year and I photographed the girls high school senior pictures now and just a really beautiful family, wonderful family. And I was at work one day and she, I was not in a good mood. It was one of those busy days, hectic days, and I was sitting at my desk and about, a session was about to come in, and she came over and she said, aren't you about to photo shoot a se session? Aren't you about to photograph? And I said, yeah. And she said, well, what's going on? Why, why are you happy? And I said, you know, I just kind of stopped, and I said, well, what do you mean? I, you know, this and this is, this is going on. And, she said, Lori, and she took my hands and, and held me still, like, stop, you know? And she said, Lori, when my family is together for our portrait sessions, it's one of the best days of my entire year. And she said, we work so hard to get all the, the girls together, to get, you know, to get us together and to get here, we finally stop and we get to be together and we get to enjoy each other and we feel wonderful, we feel beautiful, you remind us why we love each other. 
And she said, when you photograph my girls and I can watch what's happening between them, that's, you know, love just overflows in my heart. And she said, go into this session happy and go into the session with 100% and everything that you have. And, and she worked for me part time, you know, I mean, no place <coughs> to be telling me <laughs> what to do or how to run my session, you know, but it, it forever has changed the way I look at sessions. You know, she said, this changes things for us. When I watch what you do, my, you know, my heart is full. And, you know, and that's what she's seeing when she's looking on her wall at those images. And so I just want to give that to every one of you that you have that gift to give. Believe in that. Cherish it. Yes, price for it. <laughs> but, you know, but believe, if, even if you don't believe in yourself, even if you don't believe that, you know, I'm worth charging this much, believe in that gift. Believe in the gift that you have to give. <laughs>